All right, welcome back to our next chapter. This is chapter number four. segue from what we have been doing so far and to what we will be doing from now on. So going from statistical methods to um, quality control. And then we'll talk also a little bit about control charts. And before I do that, I would like to remind you that quality con in quality control, control chart is just one of the tools. There are several other tools that people usually use to keep a track of the process. And for instance, some of the examples are histograms, check sheets, Pareto's chart, a cause and effect diagram that you might have done in the past, scatter diagram and defect concentration diagram. Now we would not be going into much of the details about these methods. We would mostly focus on control charts. And so the idea of a control chart, just to give you an idea about control chart, it basically displays the quality characteristics um, that you have measured over time. And it kind of looks very much what you're seeing on the screen right now. It has an upper control limit, it has a lower control limit and a center line. And all of these measurements, these dots represents measurements. Uh, this connecting line is usually just shown uh, to show that these are sequential data, but the line, the connecting line can be, uh, can be removed easily. All right, now let's talk a little bit about um, where does exactly, why do we need exactly control charts and what can control charts actually help us investigate? So whenever we look at a process, in a process we have two types of variability. One variability which is called chance causes. And this is the natural inherent variability in the process. And if you remember, we have talked about this multiple times that there's always variability in the process that we cannot get rid of that variability is called chance causes. On the other hand, assignable cause is the one for which there's always a reason as to why it is happening, right? For instance, if um, your part is, whatever you're manufacturing, let's say doesn't meet the quality levels that you expected, then that might happen because your tool has damaged or it has degraded over time. That could happen, right? Uh, now, in, in most real world processes, you would observe both chance causes and assignable causes. But you can only detect assignable causes using a control chart. You cannot detect chance causes. So, um, to give you an idea, most real world processes uh, do not operate in, in control state, right? The process always go out of control. And whenever the process goes out of control, these control charts are used to detect those out of control states. And these out of control states uh, happen most of the time because of assignable causes. They sometimes might happen because of chance causes, just because of the randomness and the variability in the process. But most cases, uh, if there is a, if the process goes out of control, that happens largely because of an assignable cause. And the control chart will help you detect only assignable causes. All right now, what we would want to understand is what are the different ways in which a process can go out of control. So there are generally three ways in which a process can go out of control. And let me write these down. So uh, let me say here: process can go out of control or we always call it, also call it OOC, because of three reasons. The first one is there is a shift in process mean. There is a shift in process variability or standard deviation. Or C could be both shift in mean and uh, variability. Usually variability can be measured by using a standard deviation or variance, and many times we also use range to measure. Now for most cases, most cases in this course will be concerned with number one. Now even more, there could be 
uh, changes or shifts in the correlation structures that could also cause a process to go out of control. But we are not concerned about that right now. We're just concerned about shift in the process means, shift in the process variability. And 90% of the times so we'll be talking about shift in the process mean. Actually, maybe 80%, that's a good estimate. All right, so uh, we already looked at a brief structure of a control chart. It has a central line, it has upper control limit, it has lower control limit. And whenever a, a sample, so what you see here is an observation. Actually, let's call it sample, not an observation. This is a sample measurement. Whenever you see a sample measurement going out of the control limits, we call it out of control, all right? That doesn't, so if, if you see a sample outside the control limits, that doesn't mean immediately that the process is out of control. It just means that there is a sample that is outside the control limits, okay? And we'll talk about this later, when exactly when you call a process to be out of control, right? Okay, so if you think about control chart, it's very much like hypothesis testing. We make a conclusion whether a process is in, a, in control or out of control. It's very much similar to what we do in hypothesis testing. We either reject H naught or we fail to reject H naught, right? So the ideas are very similar. And so the question comes up often is, why do we need control charts? And simplest answer to that is, if you look at a, a control chart, you have consecutive measurements coming in from a process. Right, so if you were to use a hypothesis testing kind of an approach to do quality control, then you have to do hypothesis testing for every single sample. And that's time consuming, right? We cannot do hypothesis testing on single every single sample. So that's where control charts are useful. Second issue is uh, many times it's even possible to do hypothesis testing. For instance, in this case, you can see that right before 10, there is the process looks slightly different, and right after 10, the process looks slightly different. So you can do hypothesis testing in this case. Many other cases, uh, there is a gradual shift in mean. For instance, in the last example, the mean is slowly drifting away. So it's difficult to establish what is my in control process mean, what is my out of control process mean. So there are situations when we cannot actually use control charts directly. And the, sorry, where we cannot use hypothesis testing directly. And so we need control charts in those scenarios. So I hope I, I given a uh, good enough motivation as to why we need control charts. And now let's start by looking at the general model for a control chart. Now, um, I'm, I'm trying to skip as much derivations as I can, so I'm going to directly give you the general model for a control chart. And a general model for a control chart, you have an upper control limit, which we denote as UCL. And UCL, this is equal to mu of zero plus Z alpha over two sigma divided by square root of N. Central line is equal to mu zero. This is central line. And then you have lower control limit, which is LCL, mu zero minus Z alpha over two sigma divided by square root of n. We know mu zero, this is the in control process mean. So mu zero is your in control process mean. Sigma is your standard deviation and z alpha over two, you can compute if you know alpha. Right now, this type of a control chart, and we look at we look at control charts very extensively in chapter number five. But this type of a control chart, we call this as an X bar control chart, and this control chart is used to monitor shifts in process mean, or you know, in simple terms, it is used to monitor process mean. Okay. All right. So with that note. Let's actually uh, do some control chart. Let's actually, before we construct some control charts, I want to give even general definition of a control chart. Now, this is one specific example of a control chart. A general model for a control chart, you can write upper control limit UCL. This is equal to mu of W plus Z alpha over W times sigma of W. What is W? W is just some 
a quality characteristic. quality characteristic and then mu of w is the mean of the quality characteristic sigma of w is the standard deviation of the quality characteristic but in the example that we just saw in that case um, sigma of w was sigma divided by square root of n because the quality characteristic we were quality characteristic that we were tracking was x bar and x bar follows a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma square over n so if you look at the variance, it is sigma square over n. Standard deviation is sigma over square root of n. And that's where we get the square root, sigma over square root of n. Now, so you have UCL. You can also write down here LCL. LCL is equal to mu of W minus Z alpha over 2 sigma of W. Right? OK, now let's actually go and do a very simple control chart example. Let's say that we have a process which is making bearings. Inside diameter of each bearing reflects the quality of the bearing and it follows a normal distribution, okay? So X, our measurement follows a normal distribution with some mean and some variance. Five bearings made from the process are grouped in each sample. So we have N equals to five samples. N equals to five uh, observations in each sample. Observations in each sample. And then the mean diameter of five bearings in each sample is the quality characteristic, okay? So mean diameter is equal to x1 plus x2 plus dot 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 plus x5 divided by five, right? Okay, now let's construct a control chart. Inside diameter of each bearing reflects the quality of the bearing when the process isn't control x follows a certain normal distribution with mean mu zero mu zero is equal to 34 and variance which is sigma squared is equal to nine okay and we already know n equals to five so now we can write down our control limit ucl this is equal to mu zero which is 34 so let's go back so mu zero plus z alpha over two times sigma divided by square root of n so you have 34 plus z alpha over 2 sigma is 3 divided by square root of n which is 5. alpha is 0 0.05 so i can say z alpha over 2 this is equal to i think it's about 1.96 if i'm not mistaken and so your upper control limit turns out to be equal to 36.7 your center line is uh, your mean value, which is 34, and then your LCL is 34 minus Z alpha over two, Z alpha over two, three divided by square root of five. This is equal to 31.3. And now you can also visualize your control chart here. You can see you have 36.7 as your upper control limit, lower control limit is 31.3, and then you have certain out of control samples which are plotted in red. Right? right, so I hope this gives you a good idea about how to do a very simple control chart and we'll come back and discuss about this very extensively. Okay, now let's ask one question. What do we actually mean by an out of control process? Now, typically when you see one or more points beyond the control limits, we we, we assume that the process is out of control. Now, if, if you observe a sample outside the control limits, it might not reflect an out of control state. And I'll tell you why. There is randomness in the process, right? Data is coming from normal distribution. And if you think about normal distribution, it can take values anywhere between negative infinity to positive infinity. Even though the probabilities are very small to take extreme values, but it can still take outlier values right and so a process uh, which is showing let's say out of control points one or two out of control points that might just happen by chance right so if you see one out of control points it might just happen by chance that doesn't really mean that the process is out of control and when we talk about type one and type two errors in this chapter towards the end this idea will become even more clear uh, but 
in general, for most parts, if you start noticing two, three multiple points falling outside the control limits, you can conclude that the process is out of control. All right, that's one way. And then the other way is if there are certain non-random patterns that you can see in the data. And what, what, I, what do I mean by non-random patterns? So this is a list of uh, starting from number two to number six, number 10. These are some non-random patterns that you can see on a control chart. And if you see these non-random patterns, you can conclude that the process is out of control. Now, again, there is no hard and fast rule. These are some uh, observations that people made over time. There's no statistical basis for this. Uh, it's more of an ad hoc way of saying that the process might go out of control. Okay. There are certain uh, additional conditions, additional patterns. For example, in this, in these two plots, you can see that there is on the left hand side, there is a consecutive sequence of large number of points that continue to increase and then it continues to decrease. This type of a pattern, or either if you see a cyclic pattern in the data, that might also reflect that something is wrong with the process or the process is out of control. What is more interesting for us in a control chart? Now, as you as we'll, we'll, as we go into chapter number five, you'll see that control charts, you know, could be constructed very easily using uh, a jump software. And, and I'll show you some jump exercises as well, how to do this in jump later on. The point here is the idea is not all the time to construct a control chart. Control charts are typically given to us. The important idea is to assess the performance of the control chart or to see what is happening to the process. Um, to answer questions like what is the type one error, what is the type two error of this process using this specific control chart? So these are the questions that we're more interested in answering by using control charts, right? And so this is where I would like to pull you back a little bit into something that we have been discussing in the last, cha last chapter, which is type one and type two error. Now, type one and type two error, we have looked at in terms of hypothesis testing, we'll define type one and type two error now using control charts, right? So to start again, I'm gonna call the first column as HA, the alternate hypothesis, and then the second column as H0, which is the null hypothesis. Null hypothesis for a quality control problem, I can say is process in control, and then the alternate hypothesis would be process out of control, OOC, okay? And then we observe some data and then we make some inference. So our inference, let's say my inference is on the y-axis. You can either infer that the process is, let me make some space here. You can infer that your process is out of control or you can infer that the process is in control. We can make inference about this, all right? Okay, now if the process is really in control, H0, and our inference is that the process is out of control, that's called type one error. Alpha. If the process is out of control, which is HA, and then we conclude that the process is in control, that's type two error, patent. And then similarly, as we talked earlier, if the process is in control and then we also detect that the process is in control, it's called confidence. And then if the process is out of control and then we infer that the process is out of control, that's called power. Okay, now let's, let's go here. So, Let's, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper into type one and type two error. We are more concerned with type one and type two error. So let's try to understand what exactly type one and type two error is for a control chart. Let's start with type one error, okay? So for type one error, let's see what, what do we know about type one error from hypothesis testing. From hypothesis testing, type one error is probability of rejecting H0 given H0 is true. 
null is true, and then you reject the null. In a quality control setting, this is H0 is process in control. So let's say the process is truly in control. All the samples that you're observing are staying inside the control limits. All right, now process in control, but for some reason, you observe an out of control sample. Observing an out of control sample. And then this is the probability. Now, this is not, uh, if this is not intuitive to you, let me try to make a schematic here. Uh, this is, let's say, UCL, this is LCL. Let's say your process is in control. Even though the process is in control, there is some likelihood that you might observe a sample outside the control limits, maybe there, maybe here. And this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier in, in, in this lecture, that even though the process is in control, because of the variability in the process, there is some chance that you can observe an out of control situation. Now think about um, a fire alarm in your house. That fire alarm is supposed to stay silent if there is no fire. But it might so happen that once in a while, it detects a false alarm and it goes off. So the fire alarm, even though there's no fire, even though the process is in control, it starts beeping, saying that the process went out of control. And that is what we call as type one error. And that is what we call as type one error. So let me, let me try to write this down a little bit more clearly. So process is in control. And you can still observe an out of control sample. So if you observe an out of control sample, can I say that X bar, this is what we are monitoring, is greater than UCL and it's less than LCL. See, this makes sense for a moment. We are saying that observing an out of control sample is equivalent to saying that X bar is either greater than UCL or less than LCL. That's what we are basically saying here, okay? And that gives us the definition of type one error for a control chart. So now if you know UCL and if you know LCL, you can compute type one error very easily, okay? All right, now, for most cases, uh, let's actually take a step back here. Um, for most cases, many a times we actually know type one error if we know the control charts. And I'll show you how. So let's say your UCL is equal to mu zero plus Z alpha over two sigma divided by square root of N. CL is mu zero and your LCL is equal to mu zero minus Z alpha over two sigma divided by square root of n. So if you know Z alpha over two, let's say Z alpha over two is equal to three. Oh, by the way, whenever we say that Z alpha over two is equal to three, that means it's a three sigma control chart. If I make Z alpha over two equals to two, then I say that it's a two sigma control chart. And similarly, if Z alpha over two is equal to five, then we call it a five sigma control chart. In most cases, in most applications, we fix Z alpha over two to three. That is, we, we stick to three sigma control chart, okay? And in this case, you can compute alpha equals to two times one minus phi of Z alpha over two which is equal to two times one minus phi of three, which will give you 0 0.0027. So type one error for a three sigma control chart is 0 0.0027. This is something you can remember, uh, but you can always compute it, right? So if you know Z alpha over two, you can compute type one error. If you don't know Z alpha over two, you can still compute the type one error if you know the LCL and then the UCL. All right, now let's talk about type two error. <clears throat> type two error is, this is beta 
equals to probability of fail to reject h0 given h0 is not true so if h0 is not true which means h a is true in in a, in the quality control context i can say that the process is out of control right process is out of control and still you can observe a sample which is inside the control limits. And then that's the probability of type 2 error, right? So in, schematically, I can show you here, this is UCL, this is LCL, this is central line. Now, when the process go out of control, you would want these samples to be outside the control limits, right? But there is a possibility that you can still observe an in control sample. To give you an example, let's say you have this again fire alarm example. Let's say the fire goes off, but for your fire alarm to start beeping, it needs to collect some data, right? So it might so happen that the fire alarm is faulty and so it is not able to detect the smoke in the room and then it doesn't go off right so there are multiple scenarios in which your process can go out of control still you can observe some sample points inside the control limits right and that's called type 2 error and i can write this as probability that x bar is less than or equal to ucl greater than or equal to lcl that is the sample is inside the control limits given the process is out of control Right. And then this is, we already looked at the formula for computing type two error, right? Beta. You can, of course, use this formula if you know the control limits. If you don't know the control limits, you can control, you can compute beta as phi of z alpha over two minus delta over square root of n divided by sigma minus phi of negative z alpha over two minus delta over square root of n divided by sigma. And type two error is also known as. I think we discussed this earlier. Type two error is also known as the missed detection rate. Right? So think about the fire alarm example. If the fire, if, if there's a fire in the room, if there's smoke in the room, if the fire alarm does not go off, then it failed to detect the smoke. And that's why we call it missed detection rate. Okay. Now, this is a type 1 and type 2 error formula that we typically use if you know uh, that if you, if, you, if you follow the standard rule, the standard rule is one or more points outside the control limits. This is a standard rule. Right? But it might so happen that people can develop additional rules based out on some patterns, some non-random patterns, right? And so if there is some specific rule given to you then you can compute the type one and type two error probability using this rule also. So it says given a rule, type one error probability of a control chart alpha is probability that rule applies given the process is truly in control. And then type two error probability of a control chart is probability rule does not apply given the process is truly out of control. Now the formulas look a little bit abstract right now, but I'm going to solve in the next lecture, a uh, few problems with you to show you how we can actually use these two rules, uh, these two formulas to compute type one and type two error for a given rule. All right, I'll stop here. See you next time. Thank you.